All right, this is the first hour of Physics 1B, section 1376 for um, Monday, September 13th. And today we're going to continue talking about fluids. And uh, now we're going to move on. Before we talked about what are called fluid statics. Fluid statics are problems where situations where fluids are sitting still. So, you know, we talked about buoyancy. We learned about that force. We're going to learn more about uh, surface tension this week in the lab. Uh, and uh, we also talked about the concepts of pressure and density, which will continue to be important in fluid dynamics. Um, but uh, today we're going to talk about fluid dynamics, fluids that are moving, uh, things that flow through pipes, um, things like smoke, which is a fluid. Uh, and uh, we're going to talk about the rules that describe how they work. There's two main things that will, two main concepts that we're going to learn about today. So by the end of today's class, you should hopefully understand what the continuity equation is, which describes why it is that when you put your thumb over a hose, it makes the water flow really fast. And what Bernoulli's equation is. Bernoulli's equation will describe um, uh, the way in which certain things happen. And I'll give you some examples of it. Uh, some of them are like how curveballs work, how things like golf balls and tennis balls spin, but also things like how an airplane flies, uh, what causes the lift on an airplane wing that allows the plane to lift off. Um, these are all described by Bernoulli's equation along with how water flows through pipes and what the water pressure would be in you know, an upper room apartment, that kind of stuff. So we wanna learn about fluid flow and we wanna understand what these equations are that, that govern it so you can be able to solve problems and understand the concepts of how these fluids work. So. Let's get started. Okay, so the first thing we want to talk about. Oh, let me make sure. Where's my yeah? Okay, Roberto, I'll get you on the uh, attendance later on. Okay, the first thing we want to talk about are. I guess I have this a little bit out of order here. We want to talk about what an ideal fluid is. Oh boy, that's not the. So we have to make some assumptions uh, in the analysis that we're going to be doing. And for, for a fluid, we're going to talk about ideal fluid. This may like be similar to, you, you've heard of ideal gas law, right? A lot of you have probably heard of the ideal gas law. Is that correct? I never know uh, how much chemistry you have to take before you get to this, this point. You probably don't have to take chemistry to take this class. Is that right? Not, definitely not to take this class, but it's probably very optional, right? This should be new. I'm asking, have you heard of the ideal gas law? Have you all heard of the ideal gas law? You have. Some of you probably have. Some of you haven't. Okay, that's good to know. Some people, are, it's good to know that some people have. Yeah, if you took Physics 2A, you probably learned about it. And we will learn about it in this class. Okay. So ideal gas law is something we're going to learn about later. Um, and... I mention it because in the ideal gas law, you describe how the pressure, the volume, and the temperature of a fluid, of a gas, are all related to each other. But you have to make some assumptions about the gas. You have to make some assumptions, and uh, we'll talk about what those are later. Uh, those assumptions tend to be pretty good. Um, in the case of a fluid, I don't know how good these assumptions actually are, but, but they're what we use. Um, for an ideal fluid, we're going to assume that it is uh, incompressible. Now, in the case of something like air, air is definitely very compressible, so this is not at all true. But it, it's going to be good for what we're describing. I think if you think about a, a fluid like water, the idea that water is incompressible is very reasonable. Let me close this window because it's making notification sounds. Did you all hear that? It's just in my headset, so you probably didn't hear it. But So incompressible, what does that mean? That means that if the fluid were in a container and you tried to compress it, it wouldn't compress. Um, a compressible fluid would be something like, you know, air. Like if you blow up a balloon, right, and you take the balloon, you squeeze it, you can compress it, right? It will change its shape. But an incompressible fluid, while it might change its shape, won't change its volume. That's the idea. Uh, and um, no viscosity. So viscosity 
is pretty much like friction for a fluid. So that means no internal friction. Oops. Why is the undo button not working? I don't get that. Okay. That means no internal friction. That means the parts of the fluid aren't going to really um, interact with each other. They're not going to exert internal forces on each other or anything like that. So, yeah. That's an ideal fluid, and that's what we're going to be using for developing the continuity equation and developing Bernoulli's equation that we'll be using today. Okay. Um, the next thing to talk about is fluid flow. So there are two types of flow that are described in this book. I'm sure this is a simplified way to talk about it. There's probably more advanced things that you can get into with this. Um, but uh, they, they simplify fluid flow down into two types. One is called um, turbulent flow. Well, actually, let's talk about the other one first. There, one is called laminar flow. And one is called turbulent flow. So in, lam in laminar flow, the fluid flows in kind of like straight lines that we call streamlines. That's okay, Pat. Um, I saw that you reacted the first one here. So don't worry about it, man. So laminar flow means the fluid flows in straight streamlines. That doesn't mean the fluid just flows straight, but it means that the fluid as it's flowing, um, you can kind of like draw up a pathway for how it flows. So just to give you an example, if you have um, like a tube, let's say we have a tube that's shaped something like this, right? That curves like this, okay. And let's say within this, um, within this, we have some, some liquid. So there's liquid water in here. And this liquid water is kind of flowing, or whatever, they're flowing. The idea of a, of a streamline would be that I could trace a path through the fluid that would go in a straight line like this. I say straight. I mean, it goes in um, like parallel lines, kind of like this. For me, when I think about it, I immediately want to compare it to uh, rays of light for some reason. But that might not be obvious for you, but a streamline is basically some kind of straight line that we can draw through the fluid. Um, and these lines can be kind of like squeezed together and pushed apart, but they won't cross over each other. So it's like you can draw parallel lines through the fluid and they won't ever cross. That's the way I think about it. They can be squeezed together. So for example, if, let me use some straight lines to do this to show you what I mean with this. So if you have a section of a pipe that's straight, like this, and then the pipe starts to get skinny. So like something like this. I need to turn that sound of people leaving and entering off. It's going to be quite distracting. So suppose you have a, t a type pipe that is shaped like this. Sorry about that. My, yeah, I know. I, I, I totally understand. I know it's not. I know people are doing it because they're like fixing their connection or there's all kinds of reasons. I just mean on my end, I don't, I just need to not be distracted by it because I get easily distracted by little notifications. So suppose you have a pipe that's shaped like this, right? And then you have some streamlines that are flowing through here like this. And let's make these a different color. Let's make them like red or something. Okay, so you've got some streamlines that are flowing through here. Oops. Really yearn for the days that I can just get a chalkboard with a ruler without having to do all this stuff. But you can make some pretty nice diagrams with this stuff. Okay, so let's say this is a fluid. There's, there's a fluid that's flowing through here. 
flowing down this way and it's going to flow out this side, right? Each of these red lines is a streamline. So this is the, these things are streamlines here. And the idea is that now when the two, when the when the tube like gets squished together like this, um, the fluid is going to be forced into here. And so the way that that's going to happen, I don't know how well I can do this, is that these lines are basically going to squeeze together. What I want to be able to do is, let me see if this will work. If I copy paste this, copy, paste, nope, didn't work. Copy, paste, there we go. Can I squeeze it? Yeah, it's like this. You can't do that with the screen. It's like as they get into the tube, they're going to squeeze together like this. And then you'd need to connect these lines up. So we connect this one up to this one. Copy, paste. There we go. Connect this one to this one, and so on and so forth. And this is the idea of what a streamline. The one in the middle should basically go straight if I did it right. Didn't quite do it right then. So this is the idea of laminar flow. It's almost this type of perfect flow that isn't realistic. Um, and it requires that the fluid be incompressible and have no internal friction in order for the fluid to basically just kind of all be flowing in a straight line like this, never getting clogged up on something and, and flowing backwards. That's kind of the idea is the fluid's always flowing in one direction it doesn't ever like get backlogged so that it starts flowing backwards. Does that idea make sense? It's okay if it doesn't. Does anyone have any questions? Okay. What's an example of a fluid with no viscosity? See, I don't think any real fluid has no viscosity. You probably just have fluids that have really low, low viscosity, right? Um, well, I mean, so what's viscosity? What's an, what's an example of a fluid that has really high viscosity? Does anyone know the answer to that? Honey, yeah, there's a picture of it right up there on the left. Honey is an example of something that's high viscosity. What does that mean? That means that it's kind of, it's thick, it, you know, when you pour it out, it doesn't doesn't it doesn't immediately shape to its container. It takes time to like kind of settle down. Um, if you were to run your fingers through honey, you, you would notice that it is much thicker than water, denser. Um, yeah, I think glue counts absolutely. Yeah, and it depends on what kind of glue you're talking about. So some glues might have less or more viscosity, but it's that kind of like thick, lumpy flow that you get with honey. Uh, oil, I think, has pretty high viscosity stuff like. You know, if I, if I pour olive oil into a pan, or I pour vegetable oil into a pan, um, it, it doesn't immediately flatten out in the pan, right? It kind of pools up in little, I don't know, puddles almost, that take time to disperse. I think that, yeah. So, so an example of a fluid with no viscosity, I think the answer is there's, there's not really any fluids that have zero viscosity, but... Uh, we're still going to treat them as if they don't have a lot of viscosity when we look at the physics of it so we can understand some basic ideas. Now, turbulent flow is pretty much anything else that's not laminar flow, but more specifically, turbulent flow is when the fluid kind of flows in different directions all at once. And this is a, this is a picture of uh, turbulent versus laminar flow here. So this is a match that's been extinguished and there is um, smoke coming out of it. The idea is that the laminar flow is here where, where there's a very smooth kind of like nature to the pattern of the smoke. The turbulent flow begins when the air in the room starts to kick, this, kick these molecules around and they start to diffuse out. And the molecules are now flowing, well, you can't see what direction they're flowing, right? It's just a picture, but the molecules are now kind of flowing and turning back on themselves. You know, you kind of see these like knots in the, in the pattern of the smoke. And that's because the fluid is kind of like, yeah. yeah. That's turbulence. My knowledge of, you know, I, something I haven't studied deeply and maybe I need to start reading about it more, but my knowledge of physics tells me that turbulence is one of the least well understood phenomena. Um, 
in physics, um, I'm gonna we're gonna call turbulent flow like tossy turvy flow. Means it's very chaotic. And when I say chaotic, I mean hard to predict. Okay, what do, what do you say windmills, Troy? What about windmills? I think about airplanes. When I hear the word turbulence, I think about airplanes and like the, um, you know, you're flying through some air airspace and then uh, the pilot comes on and says, hey, we're about to come into a bunch of turbulence, which means that up ahead there's going to be, it's kind of like rocky waters in the ocean. It's like, it's where the air is, the air is very chaotic flow in terms of the, the wind and stuff. And so when you fly through an airplane, the airplane kind of like shakes and you know, it feels like it's going to break off, break apart maybe or something, but it's just kind of a bumpy ride that you get from, from riding on air that is turbulent, chaotic, messy. Um, so Troy says, you mentioned turbulence, and that's the only thing that comes to mind when people bring that up is turbulence. Do, does, does turbulence have a lot to do with, with windmills? Can it have some impact on their stability, their strength? Can they break due to turbulence if the, if the wind becomes too high and, and chaotic? Yeah, the shakiness, Troy, yeah. I don't know if everybody in this class, probably not everybody in here has actually been on an airplane because if you grew up in LA, there's there's no reason to leave. But uh, um, the other thing you can compare it to is if you've been on a boat, if you get into like an ocean where the, where the water is like really kind of, really high waves and tossing and turning all over the place, um, that can also be kind of similar to what turbulence is. So we're really not gonna talk about turbulence because as I said, it's chaotic, which means it's hard to predict. And in physics, you know, our goal, whirlpools, that could be another thing that's pretty simple, similar, where you have the water flowing in, uh, yeah. So we're not going to talk so much about turbulent flow. We're kind of going to assume that most of our, most of the things we do, that we do are going to be following laminar flow. You know, this nice, beautiful kind of picture of, of the way that the, the fluid's flowing, always in the same direction. Um, Largely because then we can make predictions about what's going to happen. We can make calculations. And uh, with turbulent flow, we, 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 you almost, I think you need like, I think you need computer modeling to, to solve problems with turbulent flow. So an example of a problem of, of turbulent flow that, that you have to use computer modeling for would be predicting the weather. Predicting the weather is obviously very challenging. I don't know if any of you ever, like, does anyone here ever watch a, a weather broadcast anymore? You ever turn on the Weather Channel? Or do you ever watch the, them talk about, like, predictions of weather on the internet in some way, like through YouTube or anything like that? Does anyone watch anything, st stuff like that? You reference the weather app. What does that mean? So you pull up an app and you see, like, what the prediction of the temperature is going to be. Only if it's already on, yeah. I mean, yeah. I haven't watched, like an actual weather report in a really long time. So that, yeah, actual, yeah. Anytime there's like a major event, you're much more likely to pay attention. Yeah. So hurricane is a good example because with a hurricane, they have to make predictions about where it's going to land, how intense the, the, the rain and the wind is going to be when it lands. Right. And you know, sometimes they're just wrong. Right. Does that something, you know what I mean? Some, I don't know how much you all pay attention to this, but sometimes they'll be like, Oh, this hurricane is going to hit southern Florida, and then a major wind front comes in or something like that, or pressure front, and it pushes it north, and it ends up hitting in North Carolina or something like that. Have you all ever seen anything like that happen in your lives? Where there's a huge major hurricane coming, and then they, they kind of, they're not quite sure where it's going to hit, and then, okay. So this is all because of turbulence. Not all because of turbulence, but partially because of turbulence. It is very difficult to predict what the weather is going to be tomorrow or where a hurricane is going to land unless you are predicting a few minutes into the future, right? Like I can go outside right now. I can measure what the temperature is with a thermometer. I could figure out what the pressure is with a barometer, right? And then I could tell you 10 minutes from now probably what the temperature is going to be because it's probably not going to change very much, especially here in Southern California, right? It's very unlikely that a, a weather storm is going to kick up out of nowhere and the temperature is going to change or the weather is going to change here in SoCal, right? So... Um, but if I want if you want me to tell you what the weather's going to be like three days from now, I don't know, 
so that's where the meteorologists now use like uh, computer models because the math alone isn't enough because it's chaotic and when something's chaotic you just have to model it and you do kind of like approximations on what it's going to be what it's going to be next and use that to figure out you know when is a thunderstorm going to hit a certain area when is uh, a hurricane going to come through when are you going to have uh, other kind of events so turbulent flow very hard to describe laminar flow a little easier to describe and uh, this little smoke thing is supposed to help you to understand that. I don't know if it does or not. But I mean, it kind of looks like it's flowing in a straight line right here, right? And then it kind of starts to get tossed around. Certainly if you've ever like burned incense, um, when the incense burns, it definitely has like a straight line that comes up and then it starts to like get more turbulent. So I think this is a pretty good, pretty good example. That's the demo we do in the lab is we have incense sticks. All right, so let's start using talking about some of the math of how we describe these fluids. Uh, let's talk about the continuity equation. Let's move down a little bit here. Didn't make near enough room for myself. Move these over. Okay, continuity equation. That's this picture and these pictures. Continuity equation. Okay, so here is a picture. I'm always very scared about putting a fully drawn picture up, but I don't think I can draw this picture super well. Not as well as they have done anyway. Okay, so this is a flow tube. The flow tube is your book's, um, I believe that's what they call a group of like flow lines is a flow tube. So here's a flow tube. I just think about this as just being a tube. It's just a tube, okay? And it has liquid flowing through it, all right? It says the fluid is incompressible, which means that if I try to follow the fluid as it flows along this path right here, right? If I try to follow the fluid, if I were to take some volume down here, dV of fluid, right? some volume dV. dV just means that it's a small volume, okay? Then if I were to track what that what happened to that, that, that this piece of the fluid here as it flows along the path, the tube itself gets smaller, right? As in it's wider down here and it's skinnier up here. So that same amount of fluid as it moves along to this point right here, is going to have to kind of be squished into a different shape. So whereas here it's wider and flat, here it's kind of narrower and skinny. But the idea is that we're looking at the same amount of fluid dV here and here. And we're just looking at what's happened to that fluid as it's flowed from this point to this point. So you could think that this is like an earlier time, this is like a later time, and we're looking at that fluid. And what we're interested in is how fast is it flowing? Over here on the left, we're gonna call the speed here V1. And over here, we're gonna call the speed V2. And we wanna figure out the relationship between those velocities of how fast it's flowing. Because after all, we're talking about fluid dynamics, which is fluids in motion. And when we talk about motion in physics, one of the first things we wanted to be able to describe is velocity, right? We want to be able to describe how fast something moves. And in this case, we want to be able to describe how fast is the fluid flowing at one point compared to another point. What does your intuition tell you? If I have a tube, it has fluid flowing through it. Yeah, don't worry about these other things here. This is the thing. Yeah, we'll talk about it in a second. Well, actually, let me answer your question. Let me answer your question. DS1 is the, is the thickness. DS2 is the thickness over here. A1 is the kind of area, right? And A2 is the area over here. And you can see that A1 is bigger than A2, and you can see that DS1 is smaller than DS2. V1 is speed. S is like length, okay? S is a length, all right? 
Does that answer your question, Troy? This is the reason I really, uh, I really hate putting these these diagrams in like fully drawn, is because there's just so much to take in. Whereas when you just, I mean, what I would do, and I'll draw this and get rid of it. I would say, suppose I have a tube, and suppose it's shaped like this, right? And then I would try to draw these, um, you know, DV here, piece of liquid, right? And then we'd have a DV over here. And my drawing just ends up always looking bad. <laughs> but the idea would be, this is the thickness on this side, they're calling that DS1. This is the thickness on this side, they're calling that DS2. And again, the idea is that this is just some lump of water that we're following, right? Some some piece of water that we follow as it goes from here to here. You can't really do that with water. You can't like go into the water and like mark off pieces of it or anything like that. But we're imagining that we could we could think about what's happening to a, a clump of water as it moves from this piece over here to this piece over here is the idea. Okay. So just to ask the question again, before we do the calculation, what does your intuition tell you? How is the velocity of the water here, you think, we call it V1, gonna compare to the velocity here, we call it V2? Which one's gonna be larger? You would think V2 would be faster. Why do you think that, Donald? Is it your intuition? Is it your um, experience? What is it that tells you that V2 would be faster? You are correct. You're all correct. V2 will be greater. That's right. Through a smaller area, so maybe faster, yeah. Can, have you, can you all think of any, uh, any experience you've had in your life that is like that, that will... Okay, intuition with messing around with a water hose, yeah. Put your thumb on a hose, yeah, exactly, right? If you put your thumb over the end of a hose, you're basically doing exactly this. You're, you're going from... A hose, right? If you have a hose. Hose is like just the same width, same diameter the whole way, right? Trying to stomp on an annoying sprinkler and the chaos afterwards. You stomped on a sprinkler? What kind of sprinkler was it? Yeah, so if you have a hose, right? And you have water flowing through the hose, you can do this with a... You can do this with a, uh, a faucet too if you want to. It's like, I for one, I don't have a hose in my house, but if you have water flowing through the hose and you, you close off the opening by putting your thumb here, right? So you stick your thumb over the opening, then you know that the water is gonna flow out just way faster, right? And it'll spray all over the place when you do that, right? Just by closing it off with your thumb and making a smaller opening, as you all say, the water seems to flow a lot faster. And you can visibly see it, right? You take a hose, the water normally just kind of comes out and like drips out and then you put your thumb over it, you can make the water spray much farther, right? Which as you know, it wouldn't go farther if it wasn't moving faster. So larger garden sprinkle late, like late night shift, you were doing something, but pushing it in just made the water spray harder and more. Okay, yeah, 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 yeah. I see what you're saying. Yeah, so by stomping on it, basically you, uh, you closed off some of the openings and it made it just spray harder. Yeah, that makes sense. And that's right, Donald, because the same amount of water is rushing out through a smaller area creating some extra pressure, pushing the water out faster. Yeah, that's right. That's right. You're squeezing that water into a smaller area, so it has to start moving faster. So that's what the continuity equation is all about. I kind of wish there was a better name for this equation because I feel like it's a continuity equation. I mean, that is just such a, it almost sounds like a, I don't know, like a philosophical idea continuity equation I don't know like I, I don't know it just it's a very yeah for such a simple idea it's a very interesting way to describe it okay so let's look at how we come up with a mathematical expression to summarize all these things that we just talked about okay so I need to sneeze but I don't think it's gonna happen okay so All right, so here's the idea. We start off with this picture and we say, well, we know that the amount of water that's contained here dV should be the same as the amount of water that's contained here dV. And so we can start with that. Uh, let's use red. We can say that this dV over here is the same as this dV over here. Very simple equation. 
But how is that volume? Remember, D just means small. V means volume, right? So when I look at this first little cross section here that has cross sectional area A1 and it has width DS, how would I describe the volume of this thing right here? How would I describe the volume of that? Area times thickness, that's exactly right. Sorry, I'm, I'm rearranging some things here. It may have, whoops. Oh, it's so hard to see my second screen because it's incredibly bright in my house right now. I'm trying to rearrange things so I can uh, see what it is you can and can't see. Here we go. I'll move this so you can actually read it. We're not, we haven't done anything with it yet, but okay. So area times thickness, that's right. So the, the volume on the left-hand side over here is A1, the area, multiplied by the thickness, which we're calling DS1. So this D, it could have been a delta. It could have even not been there. We could have just said A1 times S1. You know, we could have done that, but there's a reason why we're writing it like this. The second volume, DV, has a cross-sectional area A2, and it has a thickness DS2, right? Now, we know that the water's moving, so if we think about, let's look at the second one because it's probably easier to draw on the second one here. If we think about a piece of water that's on the left-hand side right here and we ask how long is it going to take for it to get from here to here, well, we can decide that that length of time is dt, the time to take for the water to go from the left edge of this to the right edge of this, okay? Then if we know the velocity of the water is v2, then we can say that that thickness, ds2, is also going to be related to the velocity multiplied by the time that it takes for the water to travel that distance, all right? And this dt, we can fix as an interval of time, like we can pick an interval of time. We can call it a millisecond if we want to. We can call it a nanosecond if we want to, right? Whatever we pick, if I take the velocity of the fluid, like let's say the fluid's flowing at 10 meters per second, just so pick some numbers. I think it's always a little easier if you understand it, if we pick some numbers. So let's let V2 be equal to 10. And let's let DT, okay, be equal to um, one, one nanosecond. What's nano? What does nano mean? 10 to the negative 9, exactly. So this is 10 to the negative 9 seconds. That's what I'm going to make dt, OK? So if we let v2 be equal to 10, and we let dt equal to be 10 to the negative 9, what would ds2 be equal to? You would take 10, right? Multiply by dt, which would be 10 to the negative 9. And you'd get, I think, 10 to the negative 8, right? which is like a really small distance. You could also write this as, I think, 10 nanometers, right? It'd be 10 nanometers. That would be what DS2 would be. So it would be undoubtedly a very small distance, right? A nanometer is, I mean, I don't know how to describe what a nanometer is. Uh, a micrometer is like the thickness of your hair. So this would be like 1 100th the thickness of your hair. If you can even imagine that, you take your hair and cut it into a hundred pieces. That would be that would be how. Uh, yeah. And this is another way to find thickness. Well, I, yeah, Troy. I'm just trying to describe what I mean by these phrases because I think often, like, you know, if I if I write an equation down like this, I mean, you might be sitting there thinking, what on earth does that mean, and why should I care, right? Well, at least I can tell you what it means. And the reason you should care is because, well, we're trying to derive something. So you want to understand where, where these equations come from. That's, that's, that's one reason you should care. But also, uh, does that make sense? When I write ds2 equal to v2 dt, do you understand that I just mean we're taking a velocity and we're multiplying it by some time interval? In this case, we're calling it 10 to the negative 9 seconds, right? It's just some time interval. Does that make sense to you all? Does anyone have any questions? If the water was flowing at 10 meters per second, and I asked, how far will it flow in a nanosecond? The answer would be 10 nanometers. 
and that would be my thickness here. Yeah, that's understandable. It looks like volume, right? The distinction in this picture is that the capital V is for volume and the little v is for, the like, scriptish V is for velocity, but yeah. Okay, so given that that's the case, we can come over here to our equation. Remember, we were saying that this volume is the same as that volume, same volume of water. So we can now continue our equation. We'll have A1, ds1 is now going to be equal to v1 dt. We're picking the same time interval in both cases. That's one of the things that's pretty key about this. Uh, and then we have a2, and now we replace ds2 with v2, also multiplied by the same time interval dt. Realize that we, we could choose any time interval we wanted to here, but the point is that it's the same on both sides, and that's valuable because then what we can do is we can just cancel this dt with this dt, and we've now gotten rid of all of the d's, and all we have left is just a1 v1 is equal to a2 times v2. And this... Okay, this is called the um, continuity equation. This is the name of it. This is the equation itself. And what it basically says is that if you stick your thumb over a hose and you make it so that the cross-sectional area here is small, the velocity has to go up accordingly. That's pretty much it. If I have, an, if I have a system where I have a tube, do I have a picture for this? I mean, this is a picture of it, I guess. I don't particularly love this picture, but it does work. In this picture, you have, um, just like Pascal's law, how is that, Christian? What do you mean? Pascal's principle? The way we derived it's very similar. Yeah, that's true. And it is, yeah, no, it is pretty similar, right? Because Pascal's law was, Pascal's law said that the pressure would be the same, and that was where force over area was equal to force over area. In this case, yeah, it's it's like small. In that case, it was like you had a force. Yeah, that's right, Troy. So what I'll do sometimes, and I probably should be doing this, is for volume, I'll put like two lines up here to indicate that it's capital B. That's one thing that I do in my notes when I'm doing it. Yeah, that's right, Christian. Yeah, exactly. The pressure being the same, the force has to change to meet it. Yeah, exactly. So put in a really kind of uh, simple way, what, what this states is, suppose that I have an opening in a, in a tube, and I have a system where the tube gets smaller at some point, and what I'm thinking about is a nozzle on a hose, for example. Like when you take a hose and you put a nozzle on the end of it. So the idea here would be, suppose that I call the area here A1, and I call the area here A2, and I tell you that there's fluid flowing through this pipe, and this fluid is flowing like this, you know, in these kind of like straight lines. The fluid will tend to compress into this uh, smaller area here, as we saw earlier. And if the fluid flows out with some velocity here, V2, and the fluid flow at this position is V1, then the way that you relate those velocities is through the continuity equation. That's what it states. I've got an opening of a pipe here. I've got an opening of a pipe here. When you look at the quantity A times V, this quantity has to be constant. You take the area of the tube times the velocity, this has to be constant, okay? And we call this the volume flow rate. Do I have room over here? A times V is called the volume flow rate. fit it in there. And why is it called volume flow rate? Well, if we look at this equation here, right? I don't want to scroll down too much. Let me uh, just take this picture and move it over for a second. So why is it called volume flow rate? Well, look at our equation here. We basically stated the dv, right, the volume, ended up being equal to, let's look at this line here, a1 v1 dt. So if I rearrange it to put the dt on the left-hand side, what I'll have is dv dt is equal to a1 v1. And I could kind of drop the subscripts. I'll leave it like this, though. 
So this is why it's called volume flow rate, right? Because A times V, area times velocity, gives you the rate at which the volume is moving. So this could be, for example, the, the unit, what would the unit for something like this be? If I've got volume divided by time, what would the unit of something like that be? What would the unit of something like that? Meters cubed per second, right? Or liters per second, milliliters per second, centimeters cubed per second, something like that. So yeah, it's gonna be meters cubed per second. Meters cubed per second. And you can describe volume flow rate for a lot of different scenarios. You can describe it for pipes moving through, sorry, fluid moving through pipes. But you could also describe volume flow rate, for example, if I have a bucket and I take a gallon of milk and I pour the gallon of milk into the bucket, there's gonna be a rate at which that fluid flows into the bucket, right? So I take a bucket, I pour a gallon of milk into it, and let's say it takes 10 seconds for the gallon of milk to flow into the, uh, into the bucket, right? Then the volume flow rate would be one gallon, which is the amount that you're pouring into it, divided by the time, which would be 10 seconds or something like that, right? So it'd be one gallon in 10 seconds, or about a 10th of a gallon per second. So that's an example of, of a volume flow rate. And with incompressible fluids, we're gonna say that this is a constant. We'll do an example, of course, but does anyone have any questions? Does this picture make sense? The idea is that uh, you've got like a, a spoon and there's honey flowing off of the spoon. This could be syrup, it could be honey, whatever. So you basically just have a bowl. They've taken the spoon, they've dipped it into the bowl and they've lifted the spoon up. And now what happens is that the fluid as it falls off of the spoon, they're saying, is that the, the flow speed increases. And as a result, the stream's cross-sectional area A has to decrease. So it's thicker up here and it's skinnier down here because the speed of the fluid is faster. And in this case, the fluid is speeding up because why? Gravity, right? Gravity is gonna cause the fluid to speed up. Uh, incense, I think, is another example of something like this that does it in the opposite way. Um, I'll have to show you this, I guess, when we go into lab, but is incense something that you all are familiar with? It looks very similar to this, but on a much more extreme, or does some of you know what I mean when I talk about incense? Little sticks that you burn. Yeah, I don't know about rain, Troy. I'm not sure. So I, when I say incense, you will know what I mean. Like, should I just go get a? I'm gonna get a picture because I'm not, I'm not gonna try to draw it. Uh, where's the internet? These pictures are not good. Here, what if I just search for incense smoke? Oh, burning. Okay, these pictures all suck. I should have, I should have looked for something in advance. Eh, some of them are okay. This one's kind of okay. Where the, the fluid, so the fluid in this case is the smoke, and there's definitely some turbulence going on here. But the biggest thing that I want to look at is this piece right here, where when it comes off of the stick, it's really skinny, and then it kind of like spreads out, right? You see how the how it spreads out? And this is because it's slowing down. You know, as it slows down, that's that fluid flow has to spread out. Right? Yeah, when I light incense in my house, it's nowhere near this turbulent. It usually flows like straight up in a line. I guess I could light someone on fire here in a second and show you. Maybe during the break I'll set something up. Anyway, so that is the continuity equation, and we're going to, some sound outside. We're going to go on break here in a second, but I just want to mention some of the other things that we can say about the continuity equation. I summarized them right here. Let me make this like bigger so you can read it. Okay, so 
there's a few different things, a few different terms that you're going to see show up in your equation, your homework. Move this where you can see it. There's going to be mass flow rate. Okay, the mass flow rate. Write this over here. Is rho dv dt. So if you take rho times dv dt, which is also from this equation going to be rho times area times velocity. Remembering that rho is density, then this is what's called the mass flow rate. It's important to understand this vocabulary because you're going to hit, see it show up in homework. Volume flow rate, we already said, is dBdt. And then if you have a compressible fluid, so I, I don't remember giving you any problems like this, but that doesn't mean one might not show up later on. For a compressible fluid, you have to put the density on both sides of your equation here. So for a compressible fluid, the more general version of this equation is rho a1 v1 is equal to rho a2 v2, but there's two different densities here. The idea would be that if, if your fluid is able to be compressed, the the volume is still going to be something that uh, is going to stay constant. Okay, so got our continuity equation, volume, flow rate, mass flow rate, a few different things here, but there's really just one basic idea here that we're going to be that we're going to be using to solve some problems. Is it the same idea with tor tornadoes having slower wind speeds at the top? It probably has something to do with that, Donald. Yeah, it probably does. Yeah. Slower wind speed at the top. It's also has probably has something to do with like the kinetic and potential energy. Um, I don't know. That's a good question. Okay, so it's ten forty. We go until was it twelve fifty today? I believe. So let's take a break for ten minutes, and we will continue when we come back. Nine five zero. No, not 950, 1050. Okay. Stop the recording.